Good day. <laughs> Jazzy, thanks so much for giving up your night off on tour. Uh, and congratulations on the book. It's so beautifully done. Oh, the pictures are amazing. The stories are amazing. I loved in particular, you know, the stories about you, 14 or 13, traveling to gigs to catch the number 14 double-decker bus with your shopping trolley and your records in it. <laughs> and there's also a beautiful story of you uh, having uh, sort of staging your own festival in your own street. And yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. go on about that in a minute. <laughs> Let's, how does the excitement of that as a teen and doing, having, you know, organizing your own big event and going to a DJ gig compare now to sort of turning up on stage to thousands of, of people on the other side of the world? You know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a very different mindset, I gather. As well, technically, how that happened in the beginning. It was the Queen Silver Jubilee, 1977. So it was about the community. And in those days, we had a class system, which we no longer have. So within our community, it's all working class people. A bit of an opportunity for a knees up, you know what I mean? Yeah. But more importantly for me and Daddy, it was our opportunity to, I guess, it was our first professional gig. We earned money from it. Um, and in those days, um, we cut our teeth in the community. And I guess coming from a large family, as I do, you know, my brothers and sisters that ran the local community centre, which again, it's not what you know, it's who, innit? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how that all kicked off. So technically it was a street party organised by your leader, the leader of the Commonwealth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's brown bread now, but um, <laughs> the legacy continues, as they say. So it's always interesting coming around to these, you know, the sub um, continents, as it were, and um, <laughs> meeting your fellow members of the Commonwealth. <laughs> Good day. <laughs> Talking about the super, super jubilee, the, the silver jubilee. I mean, at that time, punk was like at its sort of pinnacle, and I think a lot of people would be surprised at how much of an impact that had on you as a, a as a kid growing yeah. up. You see, Can it you didn't, talk about that? Yeah, it didn't. The 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 impact of punk didn't really sort of, in my uh, mind, manifest itself to a lot later on. So during the seventies, whatever we were going through was much more a community led thing. You know, I'm from a family that was, uh, that came to Britain, um, invited to Britain actually to rebuild it after the second world war. The family's divided into two. So half of us, six of us are born in Antigua in the Caribbean and the rest of us are born in England. So I'm the second generation from the family that was born in England. So the difference in terms of um, what it was about for me, or for me and my sisters and brothers growing up at that time, my elders were always taught to fit in, fit into the British way of life and blah, blah, blah. And as a consequence of that, they became more English than us who were born in England. Yeah. And we weren't putting up with the same nonsense as they were. So it wasn't about us fitting in because we were born and bred in England. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, there wasn't necessarily a divide as siblings, but on the odd occasion at church, it will kick off. You know what I mean? Church played a major part in, in our life growing up as working class um, people from the Caribbean because they've already been hypnotized, you know what I mean? From the old colonial days and put the rod of fear in them over religion. And again, when you're growing up as a teenager, you're cutting your teeth. I'm living in Britain, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. That's how I came up. Mm. Um, going to school, they used to pat your head as a black kid for good luck. Yeah. And the best bit was most of my white friends played kiss chase and stuff like that. All the brasses were interested in if I had a tail. Are you with that? I'm going to say it again. Growing up, when you were playing Kiss Chase and getting your first whatever intimate moment, 
what was happening in our community um, as a consequence of the parents coming up and ignorance, people thought black people, the, they feel your skin color would come off. Yes, this is Britain yeah. in the 70s I'm talking. You're talking about patting your head for good luck. And the, I guess this would have been installed by their parents and their ignorance. So the kids would come along and think that black men had a tail because their parents were probably telling them we were descendants of monkeys. You understand? So that's what I came up in that sort of system. So I remember things like that, like, um, you know, like going to like Church of England and those sort of like institutions, as it were, um, really boring, sitting down, doing all that bollocks. <laughs> Punk had come along. I left school 79. So in the mid 70s, post all of that nonsense there, you would have had probably the war in Ireland, which was quite significant because a lot of our brothers and sisters would have had to have joined the army coming out of school if they didn't get apprenticeship. And if you go back in history, um, Britain had a, a long history of the colonies and the different people who fought the wars. Fuck me, they didn't know it was that close, you get me? So in terms of my generation and the stuff we put up with would be post, um, I guess, post the Second World War and um, I guess the reign of Enoch Power mm -hmm. and all them guys, do you know what I mean? Which yeah. I'm sure there's quite a few people in this room would have experienced a few of the things we were. Um, but the difference was, I guess, because we were in the mother country and um, it, I was in, we were in London. So you're in the, you know, shopping window of the rest of the world as, or the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, and these are the type of things that we grew up with and um, coped with. And it's only now that we live in a PC world where they're trying to change fucking the books about, you know, it's got to finish like this or it's got to say that. Or you've got to be aware of the gender thing and all those bits and pieces. I'm old school, you know what I mean? I'm waiting for someone to pat my head to knock them the fuck out. Do you get me? <laughs> <laughs> but um, all of those things is what we come up through. And um, my great grandmother used to say, what don't kill will fatten. But the fact was, my generation in particular, um, you know, most of the kids at that time, you were going to sink, I don't know, 20 pints of beer or sniffing glue. Yeah, we're talking the 70s. Um, and my plight was really about the sound systems and, and, and music against the academics, because that was the other way out. Um, spending a little bit of time in the institutions, I realized that academic world in its prehistoric state was a real farce. It was bullshit. And I come from a long line of academics. And in terms of growing up, I wasn't necessarily partaking in any, any of the riots or anything because I'm finding my feet as a kid growing up. But I was there, you know, handing out a bottle of water, maybe breaking up a few rocks for the lads to chuck at the old bill and that <laughs> lot, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I was always about finding or navigating my way around it, possibly because, yeah, maybe the whole idea of the academics. So I was sent to Saturday school where we learned about our culture. My sister-in-law was the first black headmistress in a comprehensive school. And um, one of the dearest people growing up was a gentleman called Bernie Grant. He was a Marxist. And I, he was, you know, I miss him. He was, um, he was, yeah, he was my mentor. He was my mate. He was everything. Do you know what I mean? Um, and he was the first, one of the first black politicians that entered the Houses of Parliament. And he made 
an indelible mark on my life. Mm -hmm. And through Bernie, um, keeping certain things in place um, in the colonies, and one such thing which I can talk about now, which I wouldn't have spoken about before, was the whole idea of, um, you know, where you're from. And, um, yeah, it was just an interesting path that we ended up taking through politics. But at the end of the day, it was about, um, you know, like where your parents are from and it's the colonies and they never gave up their land in the colonies and da, 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 da. So you, you, you take your domicile, as it were, from your father. Then I guess in those days, there were a lot of fatherless children. So this was in the, manuscript of the inland revenue and the taxes so um yeah it was an interesting ride all that and it's quite possible the reason why i'm still here today that um because we only ever paid income tax through the system you know you gotta understand that's what the system was so everything that they'd set up to be against you I guess I was one of the raisins that made it through. You understand where all again, you tick all the boxes. You can't do this. You can't do that. So where were you going to find anybody that will be able to take advantage of the treaty? Blacks and Irish, because they never gave up their land. And then it was all part of the colonies. Um, interesting concept, but that's another book. <laughs> Jazzy, uh, all this, these turn of events and all these things that happened back then, your, the birth of your vision of what you wanted to do musically and creatively came from, from, from that time. If we look back at your accomplishments and, and, and the things that have happened throughout your career now, would you say that the vision, has your vision actually come to fruition the way you planned it? Like, and I mean, I'm sure there'd been a lot of turn of you know things that changed and along the way, but yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, all I wanted to be coming up was the biggest sound system in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that is just, it was as simple as that. And in terms of the journey navigating through it, um, my humble beginnings outside of the family in a professional capacity. Um, I worked for Tommy Steele for two years as a T-boy and I was under a gentleman called Richard Dodd. So we done lots of recordings. I'm a sound engineer by trade. So I was the back end of the whole industry for, for a long time. And that really helped because I was able to really see how the industry worked. And that was in the real days of rock and roll, yeah? The seventies, proper things, you know what I mean? I was charging like 50 pounds for a cup, of tea, uh, literally for a pot of tea that they'd never drink. And every time they wanted another one, you just make a whole pot. So it was just little things like that, where you were working with the studios, which were often the record labels will, you know, rinse out the artists, copious amounts of money for you to go and record in these places and they've been there for decades and that's how the old industry ran. Um, and I was on the tail end of all that. So I'd cut my teeth in the business. Um, a few name drops, Hank Zimmer is where I cut my first yeah. release over at Lily Yard. Um, Louis Jardim, Ronnie Bond. Um, uh, there were so many different bands and stuff. And what was interesting, my first job as a T-boy was cleaning, well, tidying up after the wind instruments left the studio session. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know what that is, <laughs> pretty mucky job. <laughs> so cleaning up all the phlegm and the spit for years, um, you know, see my hands. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it was, um, in those days you started at the bottom, yeah. um, and you learned your trade. It was a, a trade thing, but it wasn't a sort of job that you could go to the job center and get, do you know what I mean? So I was very lucky. Um, I think I probably went on, I remember processing a hundred letters, which was average. So everyone from RCA, Decker. Um, Delaine Lee, 
uh, Red Bus Studios, Psalm East, Psalm West. All, I remember the names because it was traumatic for me. And every time you went into a studio um, for a job, um, and I'm really not making this up, but I'm trying to think about how to say it, but technically, Pat gave me the job because she said, can you take a joke? And you think to yourself, yeah, fucking all right, isn't it? Yeah, but the jokes are pretty moody. Yeah. Um, and again, what don't kill puts a belly on you. So um, those were interesting times, being sent out for, for bars of chocolate innocently. And then you bring the chocolate back and they all say things like, no, I want it your colour. And stuff like that. And these were by big professional people. But you have to understand... That was the time we were living in. Mm. You know, the geezers beating up their wives after they come out of the saloon and all that. Look. It's everywhere. So, you know, I'm not looking for any like round of applause or anything. It's, that's how it was. And in a funny way, I didn't mean any harm, but when you use the government name, the only time that name is used is when you get nicked or you're traveling. So that's something as a funky dread that my subculture or the alter ego was about and us creating the funky dreads. It was because of all the shit that was there that you'd have to put up with, which we didn't have a choice of. You know, those things were done. You know what I mean? I come from an area where there was a rag and bone man. Yeah? I come from an area where you burnt coal. My brothers were paraffin boys. Do you know what I mean? The other side of it, you, you were getting beaten up by teddy boys. You're getting, you're getting spat at by mods and rockers. And you're getting the fucking hell kicked out of you by the old Bill. You couldn't go home and tell your parents that. So that's the kind of way we grew up. And I think it's the same where I've visited many countries. And just sitting in, I was having a smoke with a couple of guys on the lawn or a little park in Brisbane. And, you know, it was kind of nice just being, excuse the pun, back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> but hearing, you know, hearing some of the indigenous people who uh, are locked in on the old drinks and, and their life and this is their land, you know what I mean? Which is why I always give homage, you know, to uh, the ancestors of this land. Because I've, I've gone through it, you know what I mean? And I'm blessed through the ancestors of this land because the story transcends throughout our world and our diaspora. And um, it's interesting when the, the cultures meet because this is what's important, is when that our culture. And what's happened over time we've evolved. So me coming here is about our musical culture. So you are my family. And in terms of our family, and we share in all things, but the common denominator is the music and that sensibility of the music that allows us to communicate, exchange, you know, get to know each other because we're all like-minded. And one of the most important things Maybe by a happy accident happened. I knew from being around a lot of sound systems and maybe a lot of people who were rich, not wealthy, rich, that um, there's a lot more to it, yeah? And within the realms of the music, that made us inseparably linked. And my happy accident was turning my sound system into an inclusive sound system, meaning that I faced the audience, the audience were part of it. Um, and I think that outside of what, it, outside of the fact we created the stuff in London and in, in England, and it's probably unique to that part of the world geographically, the rest hinges on inclusiveness. And um, I've been doing this from, yeah, like I said, 1977. So it's, it's nice to come, you know, to, to Australia 
and um, see the evolution of our community and how it's developed. Um, and I love the fact in a strange way that the music's gone so full circle and it's gone back to an apartheid. Yeah. yeah? Because you've got house music, you've got rap music, you got rock music. What the fuck is all that about? Yeah. <laughs> right? When we sit down and, and, and reason, it's music, isn't it? It's music. And when I came up, um, I always was taught by Miss Percival, my keyboard um, piano teacher, sorry, that um, she would always say, and it's weird, I'm going to make this point again, but when you kept saying Trevor, that's not the name I use. My, the name I actually use as part of my government name is Beresford. And it's quintessentially quite English, you know? And this one will put you off. My slave name is Romeo. So that's the surname that was given by the masters that took on the estate, which I ended up finding with Portuguese. And I guess through my situation, I've been able to process it all and um, be the geezer I am today. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's important? Because when, when you are different from anybody else, it's more a case of it's fear of the unknown. And um, what was important to me, um, I guess, you know, studying and, and, and stuff like that and utilizing that little part of my brain, it was for me to understand what we say, I and I, to, to be able to deal with all the isms that exist. And part of how I dealt with that was becoming a funky dread, which I was sent down from the planet on to fight against rap attackers, backers, <laughs> and to allow us to be enjoy the pleasure of music with melody. And the music with melody allowed us to move ourselves. And in that movement, it, it moved everything. The blood around your body, the sweat, the closeness of somebody else, their sweat, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things, combined need to be in a controlled environment. And that's what we as the funky dreads are down here on earth doing. <laughs> Is this how like uh, you're between um, sort of staying grounded because all these things that you're describing are uh, and identifying are, I guess, ways that you remind yourself about like your mission and, and how have you navigated through um, I guess when I guess when when things started to roll for you and things started to be successful, how did you navigate between achieving and allowing things to sort of just come your way and staying grounded? I reckon growing up, you know, I'm a mummy's boy. Yeah, I was suckled by my mum, and um, we've got six brothers who used to beat the shit out of us. You know what I mean? Just as brothers and sisters want to toughen you up, didn't they? Part and parcel of that helped in the groundedness. I think the educational side allowed me to be calm, where I understood certain things because I put that energy into it. So not that I spent copious times at uni or any nonsense like that, but you surround yourself with good people. Education is the key. And once you have a form of education, it's just how you implement it. And in terms of me being grounded, I know it's just a vessel. So the power of what I'm the custodian for is what keeps me grounded. And the fact of, I fear God alone. I don't fear, man. So those are things that have been installed through the, maybe the time I spent being forced into church and school and stuff like that. Um, my old man always used to say, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. 
he was fucking exhausted with me. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, e everyone was my mate, do you know what I mean? <laughs> the, be the best one was, the best one it had to be the skinheads of, of Vincent <laughs> Park. Because we loved each other. And the, the coolest thing about the skinheads is that they wanted to emulate the rude boys and then the, 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 the attitude of, you know, the, the, the burliness of a skinhead, it'll be something that frightens your average guy. But if you go and talk to a biker, if you go and talk to any of those early clans kind of people, you realise there's something different. And in my manor growing up in North London, we had black skinheads. It's a funny thing to think about. Mm. Didn't have any black mods. <laughs> think about that, right? The skinheads were the ones who used to protect us. What do you think that is? Because uh, we were like-minded. Oh, yeah. They loved the music. Yeah. They loved yeah. The, the fashion. Yeah. And all the other things, because they're not all fascists and stuff mm, like that. Mm, mm. I guess there are various splinters of it. Mm. Yeah. And we look at people and we judge people by how they look. So for me, me, you know, the way we were with the skinheads, it was fucking blinding because everybody, oh, you don't go next to them. You know, they're, they're our fucking mates. First, look, this thing called beans on toast. I had that with skinhead. Do you know what I mean? Like, What's that about? <laughs> you know what I mean? Then him having like, you know, Aki and Sawfish would have been from, you know, from my asshole. And that's how the whole thing happened. But every time there was a mod or a teddy boy or something, you, you know, usually you had to run unless you were fighting them. Mm. And they never fought in ones. I remember doing loads of things as a youngster, particularly in Archway, Holloway Road and all that lot, um, being chased, me and my sister being chased by the skinheads and stuff like that. I'm sorry, by the teddy boys and the skinheads coming to our rescue. Um, and in those days, we talk about a class system and somehow there was this code of, um, you know, you didn't say this or you didn't do that. There was a, a street code, like, as it were wrapped up in the, the, the class system. Mm. So there are variants of all those things that maybe helped me to process some of the stuff that was going on. Then you have to respect it's a multicultural society and the people who are sometimes in control are the ones who always feel the most afraid, and they're the ones who are throwing down the worst atrocities because they're afraid, you know what I mean? Um, it almost sounds like punk rock and hip hop, like what was happening in the US, this is kind of like the, what was happening. Well, you in, know what yeah. a lot of it is, guys, is us working it out now. In the eye of the storm, everyone's a cunt, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but when you've had time to process it, take a look back, have some experiences, and then you realize, hmm, interesting. So you eat meat and you're a vegetarian. Let's meet halfway in the middle, something plant-based, do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, it's a bit like that. So you take little bits and so on and so forth, which is genuinely quite an interesting thing about growing up in Britain, because it was, whether you want to believe it or not, a multicultural society. Mm. That's unique to London. Don't get it twisted. Mm. It's like when I come to Australia, you think, all right, Sydney, Melbourne, and that. It ain't till you go out to where it really happens. That's Australia. All this is uh, the evolution of... <laughs> Or, you know, like Frankenstein in the fucking lab and all the mistakes. That's us, not here, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? And, and, and we found a way of functioning and, and living together. And the, the tonic for that is the music. Mm -hmm. Whether it's punk, whether it's Benny and the Jets, whether it's Bowie, 
whether it's, you know, Augustus Pablo, whether it's 10 City, whether it's a, a land down under. Do you know what I mean? It's all music. And for me, I'm old school, you know what I mean? So for me, it's about melody and lyrics. But, you know, I've got like, you know, my kids and my, you know, goddaughters and stuff like that. Shy One's coming here soon. That's my goddaughter. And she she does this incredible embellishment of all, like a fusion thing. Fucking hardly hear any lyrics, but what's interesting <laughs> is, is just hearing the music and I'm not afraid. Whereas my old man, you know, was listening to Lou Rawls and a lot of country and western and stuff like that. And when I drive to baseline, he'd be like, oh, fucking turn that down. And it's all this bop, bop, bop and all that. Look, do you know what I mean? Whereas we got to be the coolest generation that's ever surfaced the planet Earth. <laughs> you, know? Amen. you know, we do, we're doing gigs now and, and sharing um, a spliff or two with the young ones, you know what I mean? Whilst they're getting into it. And we can smell their vapors and they're aware of our home, you know what I mean? It's, like, it's fucking beautiful, you know what I mean? I'll tell you what, I did WOMAD the other day, and one of the main reasons why I, I wanted to do WOMAD again, I'd done it about I'd done it about 14 years ago, yeah? And what was interesting, I was like, fucking, what's all that about? It was all this different music and that. And whilst I was in the dressing room, the penny dropped. It was like they call it world music. And why do we have to call it? That's why I talk about apartheid. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So my next mission is to smash all of that. And it should just be music. Why has it got to be electronic dance music? Why has it got to be techno? Why have you got to be da 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 da? Well, after the days when it was all eclectic, you know what I mean? John Peel picking up something. You go, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So... For, for us in this room, in our community, that may still exist. We're not pushing it on anybody, but again, that's how, that's how the trees grow, you know what I mean? This, that, you know, all the vitamins and the, the light and all of that, look, it's all by the different music, the different smells, the different energies. And you get out and you listen to it on the, some speakers, like, oh, fuck yeah, I like that, do you know what I mean? Love a bit of that. Yeah. And what's interesting now is that, for us lot, probably in the room, we, we could probably absorb music a lot better than the other bit. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up sounding like my old man. So I'm going to tap it on the head. <laughs> <laughs> Can I take you back to the, sound, the early sound system days? Because your brothers all had uh, sound systems mm -hmm. as well. But in those, and we were just talking about that compartmentalization of music. In those early days, those sound systems were basically reggae music and playing lovers rock. But so it was quite radical for you guys to just go out and start playing soul and and rare groove, right? On those well, on those sound systems or not? Nah, not no. at all. London, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Everything happened there. Everything happened there. So <laughs> what's interesting is that I remember we went, used to go roller skating with two sessions at Alexander Palace on a Sunday. And the DJs used to play there. There was this geezer called Emperor Roscoe, DJ from Canada. And um, Froggy and Martin had a, a, a custom orange sound system, which they would have called the disco back in those days. And their view of um, DJing was, you know, with the lights, it was in the pub, you know what I mean? They're a bit in excess, you know what I mean? <laughs> Back room of the pub, <laughs> all that kicking off. So at this one session, our local sound system, which was Fat Man Hi-Fi from Tottenham, um, usually played at these afternoon gigs. But for some reason, these guys are putting this massive sound, well, you know, disco rig and so on and so forth. And it seemed like Roscoe was playing against Fat Man. How'd that work? Like, you're thinking reggae, da, 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 with this Canadian Jack Daniels voice DJ, you know what I mean? Who I actually adored, because I used to build these little amps from Edgware Road, and it started off these radio things, you, 
you know, build the set, you know, and solder it and put all these bits together. That's how I built my first preamp. That's how I took all the electricity shots and so on and so forth, knowing not to touch the line, you know what I mean? <laughs> Earth it to the chassis, all that nonsense. Anyway, we're up there. And um, for whatever reason, Fat Man Sound does not fire. There's a technical problem. Fucking Roscoe wins the day. Changed my life. Yeah, right. It changed my absolute life. Because there I was looking at all these white geezers fucking annihilating the sands. It's like, ooh, the Bourneville moment here. But what I ended up doing, I always considered the experiences as they're half full rather than they're fucked up. So I looked at the whole thing and analyzing it. And that's one of the main tweaks I made was that I moved from being part time to full time, being super diligent, understanding the difference between all those speakers probably canceling each other's out, learning about Ohm's law. Moving from like the, uh, the, the later vowels and that whole DC power to MOSFETs, then into A class and all these different amplifications. Um, the application of uh, moving Carney around. So I couldn't drive. That's the story of the 14 bus. <laughs> yeah. So I learned quickly, probably because I'm on the back end of the scene. So it's not a secret, yeah? This word efficiency. And a lot of the DIY sounds, you know, we didn't have XLRs, the, you know, soldering was out the window. <laughs> Remember, used to use matchsticks. Yeah, swan were always the best. Yeah, swan matches. Yeah. <laughs> Any technicians in the ass? You know, when you smash the plug, you got to stick the cable in because you ain't got a fucking ceramic plug. <laughs> You stick the wires in and hammer in a couple of matchsticks that'll keep it in place. <laughs> this is before we got good on gaffer tape. <laughs> so it was little things like that. And then I learned the difference between, uh, I remember doing an installation um, when I was at Theatre Projects. You'd know the place as Camden Palace. I worked for Tannoy for a few years. And one of the tricks, what he had, he had this dual concentric unit Weren't really any good. I, I'm sorry, Sean. I, I know someone's recording this, so fuck it. <laughs> but it weren't really good, right? But what was interesting is that um, they created a cabinet that had six dual concentric units, yeah? And um, they'd power each unit individually. So each one of these things had an amp and blah, blah. Anyway, the, the argument about it being efficient and detailed, the sonics being detailed. So all the crossover points were in place. Da, 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 da. Um, we were still playing from an analog turntable, so the sound was pretty amazing. That was my first claim to fame. And then I learned that if I used dual concentrics on a tripod, I could stick maybe 16 of them in a little van, yeah? With a couple of tripods and stuff like that. Those times, the amps, we used to have them, these little, um, you know them as crown amps now, but these little amps, right, um, made in England, were only like 50, 60 watts. But it was the four RMS at eight ohms. And um, fucking hell, I'd start to put these things in and it, it was really working and stuff like that. And then I learned for the weight against what you had to move and so on and so forth. And that's how I developed my sound system to be so efficient. I had looms made. Um, it was still the DIY idea. So we're looking at all different speakers from Altex to Clipforms to um, JBLs. And then I'm going to sound like a snob, but... The British always had the best engineering, especially in those days, you know what I mean? Um, we were using some really interesting things. And that's how my sound system became um, one of those sounds that 
played all night and had a little bit of clarity and um, was reliable. Where in the DIY sense, you know what that could be like, do you know what I mean? It's too many chefs, you know, one of them. <laughs> so in one of the songs, I always say, for one to make a decision and the rest to follow, it wasn't preaching. It was more about the knowledge of what you knew of what to do. And I kicked down a lot of sound systems like that, especially going, you know, in our day, um, you lot call it hip hop, but it was electro. We were B-boys. So when we traveled to other places, we were bringing what you call an electronic sound. Um, but my thing sounded so good because the stuff was tuned to that music. You understand? Rather than it being an array of um, everything. And those are the kind of little things, little nuances that I guess I picked up from an apprentice working in the back room and seeing the guys always trying to get perfection and stuff like that. And um, there were loads of mistakes and experiments. And, I, and I, I'm a hoarder, so I'd collect all the old gear that they'd never use and take <laughs> them apart, just like a, when I was a kid. And that's how I built my sound. I built a sound system that you plant in the middle of the room, had 16, 18 inch um, subwoofers, scoops, JBLs, um, I had 16, 10 inch JBLs, about 12, 24, 25 tweeters. And because I'd been to America and, you know, my family involved in music and that, where sound systems used to have their horns like all in one, well, we'd come along and you would make a, like an area, so a surround sound. And then I'd have all the JBL 2425 just hanging off a, a bit of a chain and they were floating. And um, I found out years later that Duke Reed and those early sound systems, they used to put the tweeters in the trees. And, and you think about all these things and you laugh like today, but that was the height of technology. How are you going to produce this sound that everybody would hear, right? You know, in the old days, the sound was down there and every engineer would tell you, fucking geezer, block, get out of the way, you're blocking the top. You know what I mean? <laughs> Boom. Do you know what I mean? Like that. So we used to fly as, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. And it's weird because if you go back and you look at anything from the 70s, particularly the disco era, um, they copied, no, 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 no. It was coincidence. But all of those things were um, looking for the perfect sound. And that's why in my mind, in my laboratory or, or, or in London with what we were doing, um, the sound was so efficient. Um, you know, I used to use a lot of like really good equipment, but I had tons of it. So it was multiples of all this great equipment. And that's what used to fall the bigger sounds. Cause I was just a kid, you know, well say a kid compared to those big sound systems. Um, that would have been just a little bit after the 14 bus with the trolley and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> but you could probably see how much I was into it from the young part. So I kind of got a reputation as a bit of a nerd and stuff like that. But, um, you know, my family was pretty notorious. I know I'm with fuck about, do you know what I mean? So I was given that little bit of path. And I think those are the things that help keep my feet on the ground. Um, because I'm a nerd, I love that. Even when my crew will be packing up at the, you know, at the end of a show and I come out of the dressing room, I still like it. I'll, I'll go around. I might pick up a couple of cables. I don't lift much anymore. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I will be mouthing it off. Do you know what I mean? And I've got scars to, to that beer from when I was in the sound and you're in the back of the van and the speakers will fall on you when you go around corners and stuff like that. Fuck, me and dad ain't got so many. I remember one year we, we had enough of the speakers pinching us and we said... When we go home, so we're never traveling in the back. Of, we're never going to be what they call a box boy. Yeah. All those little things. Those are the things that, um, that make you. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, if it don't make you, it breaks you. Leaning into like learning and mastering skills and becoming res like stronger and resilient. How, like, how's that been for you throughout your life? I mean, has it been an easier path as you got older? Um, like that habit, you know, like, 
dealing with that ebbs and flows. You know what's weird? Mm. I don't know anything else. Yeah. I, I don't know what, you know, when it's all sweet and nice. And that creeps me out. Do you know what I mean? Like, how's that all nice? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't know. This is what I know. Mm. And I love it. I fucking love it. You lot called up, bro. I was having something to eat. I was about to have a shit in the shave. And they go, nah, you got to come down and do this thing. You know what I mean? It's like, that's what I'm into. Yeah, let's do this. Rock and roll, do you know what I mean? Sweating and everything, you know? But that's like the game. And, and for me, it's a little bit like, I, I enjoy that side of it. Dean was losing his nuts. We were like, fucking hell yeah. Oh my God, get the truck. The driver was having a mirror as well. And I'm sitting there just fucking winding them all up. <laughs> it's brilliant. But a, a reason why it's brilliant, because I don't sound weird, but it makes me feel young. You know what I mean? I'm in it. Yeah. You can't blag a blagger, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm in it. I'll know about that, do you know what I mean? And what's the other great thing is, when I'm around the young'uns, is to learn from them and constantly being inspired. Yeah. And that ain't now an age thing or, or, or a, you know, whether you're male or female. It ain't about that. It's like, if you got information and it's something good, I'm in there. Yeah. I'm that far up here. <laughs> 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 Can I remind you? She's glad, there is she? Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Can I remind you of another little story in the book which I absolutely loved because it was just so evocative. When you first went back to Antigua, where your family's from, and you have this beautiful memory of going fishing on the beach and cooking the fish with no foil, just on an open fire. But then you take the fish back into the water and you eat it in the in the ocean. And I, I can't quite remember what they did to the fish, but just how All right, so in. you know, like, Such as, as poor movie. people, right, the food you eat is over seasoned because it's old. Yes? <laughs> I don't know if many of you know it. Fucking hell. Ooh, privileged lot here, isn't we? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, technically, loads of spices and stuff like that. And I'd be fortunate enough to just have good product that, you know, maybe has a little dash of salt and maybe a little olive oil and blah, blah. But back home, the fishermen, uh, when they get their um, catch or whatever, they ain't got all that foil and all that nonsense. So this particular fish, how you can um, cook it like that, the fish is called doctor fish. I don't know if you, I don't know what they call it here. The fish is very hard skin. But underneath, it's like cod. So what the fishermen then do, in my country, we have 365 beaches. So every corner you turn is a beach. Yeah. So we'd go out um, to a remote, I don't know, peninsula or whatever, and we have these barbecues, and everything is from the land, and you put back in the land. So... My first experience of that is going on a fishing boat to a really remote cove. And then they're, they're, they're choosing specifically the fish, what they're going to eat. And I'm, I'm just assuming this now. And I'm sort of seeing snapper, trout, deer stabs, bream, and all these kind of fish. And then there's this black fish, or it's like brown, and it's got like patches on it. And it's really fucking ugly, right? <laughs> and they, they, that's the fish that they keep picking. And I'm thinking, I'm fucking from England. Where's the ketchup? You know what I mean? <laughs> then they're picking this stuff. And so anyway, they, they build the fire and everything. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, they're going to put a grill on it or something or at least a bit of foil in it. So they do whatever, take out the guts and the eyes, right, they kept the eyes in or whatever. All scaled, yeah? And chuck it on the charcoal like that. You think, fucking hell, that's going to die, isn't it? <laughs> Literally, it's not sushi. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Anyway, you get this fish on the beach in your speedos and you're cleaning, you know, like when you burn toast, yeah? And you're scraping off all the burnt bit. You literally get this fish, yeah? It's all fucked up. You go in the sea and the salt from the seawater 
is what infuses the, the, the fish, yeah? And somehow, as messy as it is, like eating with your hands, in the sea, with little fishes around you eating all the rest. Listen, the sweetest, most... Are we just, what was that restaurant we went to? I ain't got nothing on this fish, I'm telling you. <laughs> this fish alone burnt to a crisp. <laughs> but somehow the seawater and everything, it, it balances it out. And from Dessa, that's love fish, you know? And um, yeah, I've been eating fish ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so many of those little stories in your book um, make your childhood sound really idyllic. And yet, I, when I compare you to people of your generation living in England, you know, music people, they always talk about London as being grey, you know, dire, uh, depressing. And even though you mentioned the, the, the shit that was going on, your stories m make it sound like this was, a, this was a fantastic time. You know, the world was my oyster. That, and uh, it makes me think how much of an optimist you are or how much of a always seen the opportunity in something rather than the downside of something. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> has, that stay, that. has that stayed with you for your whole life? Like, is it that kind of always seeing the, maybe not the good side, but the opportunity in something? I'll be honest with her. You know, Bernie helped me understand something. It's, it's half full, it's not half empty. Yeah. Um, the seniors that have been around is always, you know, Every mickle, mech and muckle. Um, there's good in everyone. And there's situations where it could be just bare misunderstanding. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's what's in your mind's eye. And it's what you, ever you believe. Um, but like I said before, it's God alone I fear. So from that point of view, um, everything's an adventure. Especially waiting for seven minutes for a lift in the hotel. <laughs> I'm working. You know what was good about that? I met loads of people who were also waiting for the lift. And the biggest laugh I've had tonight is two Aussie geezers actually going to themselves. Like I can hear them because they're it's a you know it's a confined space. Fucking sounds English, mate. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to work out who I am. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Fucking brilliant. Love it. So it still happens. Do you know what I mean? And then, you know, on, on us departing or whatever, they're going to fucking remember me. Like, I'll remember them. And I'll embellish on that conversation on the next round, yeah? <laughs> so, you know, people are people. And I, I, I guess in a funny way, I'm a people's person. Um, and... Um, the idea of what we've all come to, um, I'm just one of those sort of proud fathers who believe in our community and in terms of sense of always feeling, we would say, I protected, I feel protected, not just by the red, black and the gold, but by our community and all the members of our community. So I know I could never get lost. And inside of that, that's why I say as well, I don't think the idea of me fearing, it's more the case of the unknown. But um, many guys have, that I've come to know in the music business from a spiritual point of view have always said that, you know, I'm the kind of person who would walk alone. But not in a bad way, in a good way, because like I want to come here, I want to meet you guys, I want to see you guys. And then when I leave here, I might go another place and then meet other people and then by the time the journey's finished wow we're really super powerful and it is intact and it is real and that's why i say is the i'm just the the, the i'm just a soldier for it still you see me and inside of that is something that we all created ourselves so um in a strange way it's still fun do you know what i mean and, and in the fun it's like an adventure playground. Or even within Celestine's prophecy, you're walking through the garden, you see all these beautiful things. See, ya? all beautiful people. You come out, fucking hear Jazzy mouth it off for 20 minutes. It's blinding, <laughs> isn't it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs>
Do we um, ask the crowd if they would like to ask any questions? Does anyone out there wants to? We got make it difficult. Enough. I'm not <laughs> yeah. taking any We've shit questions. We've got enough time for maybe <laughs> make it three hard. questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, every day I do that, fella. I guess the difference is, is what name it goes under. But yeah, every week, every day, someone's doing sunny. Um, that's not enough of an answer. The next part is I'm now currently composing and working in Dolby Atmos. And um, I'm really interested in the future. Um, um, I'm working with quite a lot of different um, developers who are developing the product. And um, I'm at it every day, mate. You need to listen to my radio show on My Soul uh, on the Sunday. Uh, I'll do three till five. Then I go up the road and I'll do solar radio from six to eight. And this happens all on one day. Wow. And um, yeah, it's eclectic. It's new, it's old, and there's a lot of stuff that I won't even talk about because I'm testing it. So until you not come back and say, what was that song there? Or Dean may do a mix, or Booker may do a mix, or Rams in Fen, or The Chronicles, or whatever. Every day I love it. Do you know what I mean? The difference is music has changed, I guess. And this whole idea of um, these productions that we knew um, or as a one stop have now been a binary thing where um, we're streaming ideas, where we're exchanging in a slightly different way, where you're looking for this name to pop out all the time because we come from a time where the producer or, or, or the Sonics, you fucking knew what the sound was. Maybe you're bombarded with it. Do you subscribe to streaming? I do, yeah. Enough said. Let's next question. <laughs> <laughs> Jazzy, I really like your music. Yeah. Um, I think you're so good. I was a good one. There was one that I just really there was a there was a line that said actor center, center of the world. Uh-huh. Did you study acting? <laughs> <laughs> She's messed that one up, isn't it? It's the accent. Do you remember the song? It's you know Africa. Africa is the center of the world. Yeah, we know that. Did we, I get it wrong? We all know that. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the actor's center. Uh, Africa. I'm so sorry. Oh, African <laughs> center. <laughs> Obviously. Now give her a round of applause. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. 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 I no, 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 you know what's important, you know what's important about that is we've got nothing to do with insulting, nothing like that. No, you know, the no. beauty of that is, the beauty of that is, so you ask the question, yeah. that's what's important, all right? So, no, look, on a serious note, you ask the question, have you seen the Peter Kay sketch where he gets out all the things where you, he thinks it's a, it says this and you think it's that? Yeah. Blinding yeah. in it. <laughs> Similar scenario. You lot got to watch that. It's better than Spinal Tap. I love it. <laughs> look, look, but what the lady said and what she asked, and if you remember what I said before, yeah. Miss Percival, you know, explained a great yeah. melody is never forgotten. Miss Where she's my, she, she was a blind, she was my blind piano teacher, right? And that's how I ended up working for the R and I B the Royal National Institute of the Bind. I used to make talking books, audio, which you now know as audio books. Mm -hmm. We used to, they used to be for the blind people, it was called talking books. Yeah. And that, that was an educational thing. So I used to be recording all those, sitting down, fucking hours listening to rubbish. But what was good, <laughs> you know, we used, we used some great equipment, do you know what I mean? But what was lovely about what you said was that Nothing. You, you know when they say that, you, you know, all singing the same hymn and that lot. Yeah. Slightly different melody, but you were in there. <laughs> that, that's in. No, no, no. It. You're an actor, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You see? I'm so related in that way. 
And that's the beauty of it, you know? <laughs> no, 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 it's yours. It's whatever you want. I, did, uh, I wish I would have said what she said, but no, to really get it, no, to really get it is the fact that you remembered the line, right? And you remembered the line to mean whatever you heard. So I'm going to use this term, lost in translation, right? And I'll tell you what, how many songs have you got that you listen to on your cassette that you've gone and said a lyric? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many times have we been on stage? In the shower. And, right? <laughs> but here's another good thing. I'm on stage, you're giving it all this, and you, you're like, you're in, the, you're in the mood of it, and then you, you totally forget the lyrics. <laughs> but you're riding the melody and that's what happened there do you know what I mean she was locked in the melody it could have been anything actor actor actress Africa it could have been anything it's all on the same spectrum isn't it you know what I mean I like that Thank you very those are kind of questions I want go on over there <laughs> So good. Right, right, right. right. Um, it's also what you really think for us as black kids growing up, and you fucking your trailers like, right, you're making us feel strong and proud. Word. Looking at the music now back home, right? Who do you think is carrying that play? Who's carrying that torch? I'll be honest with you, I hope nobody isn't carrying it, because I want them to carry their own. I want them to, you know, to illuminate the sky with their own sound and maybe they utilize that as inspiration. Um, ever forward, never backwards. And the only time you go backwards is to understand the principles. But in terms of who's doing it, they're, they're, for me right now, there's so many, I'm loving it. And, it and, and because of the technology, it's made the world so much smaller. But if there was anyone I was going to pick, I ain't had a smoke yet, so <laughs> I think probably Children of Zeus. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, yeah, Children of Zeus. Again, I, I, I've got to big up this producer. Um, her name's Shy One, right? Um, yeah, I put my money on them too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Shall I want in Melbourne at the moment? Let me give her a shout, I'll find out for you. <laughs> you know what's good though? You can just Google that, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got to ask much questions. If you want the definitive thing, or otherwise I can say, oh yeah, she called me yesterday because she wanted somebody to get into a gig and blah, blah. No, that's not the only reason why she called me. But I believe she's on her way. She's on her way coming to Australia. Jazzy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've just got one other bit, yeah, one other bit, one other bit. Are you lot hiding the books or something? No, no, oh, we're, 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 they're down the back. We're oi, 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 get a book in. <laughs> get the book in. <laughs> yeah, you know, I preempted that though, don't you? <laughs> so if, it's if sealed, you did... and it's got your name in it. I've done it already. Yeah, if you did order a book, it's and you got your name book, on it. It's on the it's back with signed, your name on it. It's shrink yeah. wrap. <laughs> done. Job done. It's beautiful, the book. Thank you, guys. It's so beautiful. It took me 10 years to put that book together. <laughs> now, Jesse, you're going to be doing a bit of a set for us here. Oh, oh, I was I'll spin a couple of trees. I've got no vinyl though. <laughs> Everywhere you go Better. these days, they go, oh, play some vinyl, play some. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving the times, isn't we? <laughs> Slugging around records anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, thank, um, thank God for technology. Yeah? <laughs> Please give it up for Jazzy B. Come on. Oh. Give it up. Give it up. Uh, <laughs>